Good to be with the saints this morning. If you would, in your Bibles, we're going to look at a lesson we've looked, um, not that I've personally done it, maybe to an extent, that we've looked at here at Grace Alive before, but there were some extra things I was able to dig up along the way, we'll talk about it a little bit. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 23. Let's see if we can find a pen that works. A marker at works. How about that? First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we appreciate the opportunity we have this morning to come together and to study your word. As we take that time this morning to look and study your, your word, May we, through the process, be edified, and may your name be honored, magnified, and glorified. For it is through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, most holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we see the trichotomy of man. Man is made up of three entities. It specifies very clearly that we have a spirit. A soul and we have a body I love the way that's listed in there is it's done for a specific reason isn't it most people when they talk about the trichotomy of a man woman you get the idea when I say man it means women too uh, when we talk specifically about this what order do we normally say it as where's our focus on Ta-da! It's faced, focused on the body. It's focused on me, mainly. It's something that I'm worried about. It's something that I want to discuss. It's a body, soul, and spirit. Well, that's not the case here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 23. It's very specific that God, he prays that God, the whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. What's listed first, of course, is the spirit. And that's where our focus really does need to begin we really need to look at that spirit first and that we're going to look at the, and tear this apart just a little bit and talk about things and where we're going to begin is let's talk about the spirit let me ask you this which I know you know the answer to the question where does your spirit reside in you your spirit resides in you. If you would with me, go to Second Corinthians chapter or First Corinthians chapter two. I apologize. First Corinthians chapter two. In First Corinthians chapter two, we're going to see that our spirit really is inside our body. First Corinthians chapter two. And I'm getting a little of that wavy thing I was talking about, so bear with me. First Corinthians chapter two, verse number eleven. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man, which is where? The spirit is inside the person. So when you want to look at the body, soul, and spirit, or spirit, soul, and body, I, excuse me, I said that incorrectly already myself, you want to look at that spirit, you want to look th and recognize it is, of course, is inside your body. What does that spirit help you recognize? <coughs> tough question? It's not a tough question. God. What's that? God. Yes! God conscious, I guess we could call that. <coughs> it helps us recognize that God absolutely does exist. Look at John chapter 4. would help if I went to the right chapter, wouldn't it? <sighs> it's going to be one of those days. I only had about three cups of coffee so far today. I should have had four or five more of them by now. <laughs> you guys didn't know I like coffee, did you? <laughs> All right, let me turn there. John chapter 4. Says he can't sleep. 
I don't understand why that is, do you? Typically it used to not bother me, but I got to <laughs> knock that off. So, John chapter 4, verse number 24, where we see God is a what? And they that worship him must worship him how? Do you think this is important when you recognize the spirit is inside the man? If the spirit is inside the man, it helps that individual come to the realization that God exists. That's something that, of course, as I've heard Tracy mention many times, your friendly neighborhood dog doesn't have any understanding of that, which is, in my mind, the idea is perfect. It shows that dogs don't have a spirit like you and I have. Can dogs look at the sun and say, wow, something had to create that? No. If they see the moon, can a dog look at the moon and say, wow, look at that big white ball in the sky. Somebody had to put that there. There must be a God that did that. Can a dog do that? You know what a dog can do? Oh, we have neighbors that have dogs like that. They drive us nuts. They wake us up all time of the day. And they, yeah, anyway, that's a subject for another day. But that spirit helps that resides inside our body is an entity that was created to help us recognize that God absolutely positively exists. No question about it. And if you would with me, go to, bear with me one second while my notes are floating across the page here. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter number 1. And verse number 20. Romans 1, verse number 20. For the invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly what? Just because the world exists and you look out and you see the sun and the moon and the stars, that proves without question, without shadow of a doubt, that God exists. Creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Mankind has no excuse to, rec to not recognize that God exists. Just by looking at creation is perfect proof with that God exists absolutely had to create this it just couldn't have happened you know people talk about the big bang theory about there was, there was a tv show on not too long ago called the big bang theory that i we watched here the other night there was a rerun of it and we laughed and realized how silly the show actually was it was very good but they call it the, they called it the big bang theory and these guys the one guy sheldon was his name was an atheist his mother was a christian who was <coughs> called herself a born again Christian, okay, which is another subject for another time. But Sheldon was absolutely not, no way God exists. But I remember in one of the shows she said, But look at all the stuff that's out here. Can't you tell that God absolutely? And that's what that proves. Your spirit, which is inside you, is inside you. When you look out, Gazunite, you're welcome proves without question, without hesitation, that God absolutely, positively exists. This, by the way, just as a side note, is often referred to as the mind. Pardon, hon? <laughs> question when you refer when you refer to it as the mind whose mind do you and I possess it's refer woo it's referred to as the mind of Christ that proves without question, again, without any hesitation, that God exists. Now, if we have the mind of Christ, 
not a tough question. Where do we go to look for the mind of Christ? In the Bible, in the scripture. Go to Leviticus chapter 24. Leviticus chapter 24. Some of this we're going to go through pretty quickly. Leviticus chapter number 24. And if you would, along with me, go to verse number 12. And listen to what's being said here. And they put him in word that the mind of the Lord might be showed unto him. We'll stop there for one second. Here we see a gentleman that's put in word that the mind of the Lord might be showed to them. We already mentioned the mind of the Lord. We have the mind of Christ is scripture. Question, who is referred to as the, as the uh, word of God? Who? John chapter number one, right? Jesus Christ, is Jesus Christ God? Yes. So you want to find the mind of the word, mind of the Lord, where do you go find it? Look at verse number 13. And the Lord did what unto Moses? If the Lord spoke to Moses, what did he use? His mouth. And he translated words. We have the mind of Christ. Do we have the word of God residing inside us? Yes, we have Jesus Christ residing with inside us. Do we have, by looking at that, the mind of Christ, if Christ lives inside us? Do, and we have his word. Without question, we have that. If you would, how do we get that word? Go to Hebrews chapter 4. Look what it does to us. They put the gentleman in word that the mind would be showed unto him. And the Lord spoke unto Moses. He gave him his word. Hebrews chapter number 4. This shows the absolute importance of having, as Tracy went over the last several weeks about the importance of having a perfect word of God. By having the perfect word of God, we have the ability to see what's on his mind, so to speak. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12. For the word of God is quick. What does quick mean? It's alive. And powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Ta-da! To the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What does that word of God have the ability to do? It can read you. It knows you better than you know yourself. Have you ever looked? I'll just say it the way it is. I have sl sleep apnea. You know what sleep apnea is? All right. Good doctor, by the way, Bob. You are absolutely right. He's good. There are times I've lied awake at night and you think on things because you can't sleep. And all of a sudden it hits you and you think, remember that old V8 commercial? You'd smack yourself on the head and go, wow, I should have had a V8. When you're lying awake at night and you're thinking on things and it's like, wow, I never thought of that that way. I just thought of it. I didn't know that before. You know about that scripture, what it has the capability of doing? Reading you. And again, it knows you better than you know yourself. Verse 13, Neither is any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. That book knows you and me. And as it says in verse number 12, to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and intents and the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, it's able to take you and slice you open and show you and I who we are. 
think back to the day you got saved. Now, I'm not like, I remember where I was and what happened, but I couldn't tell you that it happened on April 22, 1984. I can't do that. Don't have that ability. But what happened was there was an individual. <coughs> her and her daddy and mother talked to me and gave me the scripture. That word of God was able to slice me open and show me that I was short, that I was deficient, that I was a sinner, and that I needed a savior. That book took me, sliced me open, and flayed me and said, this is who you are, Bob. You're a sinner, and you need a savior. Trust in that shed blood of Jesus Christ as final payment for your sin. And I rejoice in the fact, of course, that that's what happened that I did get saved as a result of that. But that scripture was able to take and slice me open and say, Bob, you need a savior. That's what the scripture has the ability of doing. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your heart. It knows you. Where do we go to find that kind of power in the scripture? That's the importance of recognizing the importance of Scripture. 2 Timothy chapter uh, 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look at the power that resides in Scripture. 2 Timothy 3, verse we know well here. Almost all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. I got white out and I changed it. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. What does it mean when there's a profit being made? Is something good happening here? Oh, yeah. It's profitable for doctrine, as Scripture gives you sound doctrine. For reproof, reproving is very simply finding a fault. Have you ever been reproved in your life by your parents? I guess sometimes it was news whenever I wasn't being reproved by my parents. <laughs> now, Rhonda, you didn't have to agree with that so much. You know that. Oh, <laughs> you were thinking of you <laughs> and your kids. It finds a fault for correction. Once you find a problem, what does it have the ability to do? Correct it, fix it, make it right. For instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be what? Perfect. You and I have the ability of being perfect. Do you realize that? Now, that doesn't mean that's going to happen, because even though I'm a saved individual now, that the moment I cease breathing, I'll be forever in the presence of our Lord for all of eternity. I have it all. Told a friend of mine yesterday, crazy, <laughs> that in spite of all, okay, you're a friend, I'm sorry. I wouldn't get used to it. <laughs> Love you, brother. All right book is able to take you and has the capability of making you perfect in spite of all the things that are going on around about you in spite of all the problems of this world I know that the moment I quit breathing and I'm standing in the presence of Christ I have it all I need nothing and I'm thoroughly I'm completely furnished unto how many good works all of them see the importance of the spirit the Spirit works through the Word. Remember back, we looked at a little bit ago in uh, Leviticus chapter number 24. God gave to Moses his Word, his perfect, holy Word. And we were shown the mind of the Lord. You want to go look and we'll see where the mind of the Lord is? You have it right on your lap. And again, stress the importance of a perfect, 
unadulterated Holy Scripture. It's imperative that in order for us to be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, we need a complete Holy Scripture to help change us. Remember, that book is able to take and slice you open, show you for who you are. And once you find out there's a problem that is wrong and needs corrected, you can change it to match the Scripture. How many times have you ever thought something about the Word of God and went, oh boy, I never saw that before. I better change my idea on this. Have we ever done that? Oh yeah. Have I ever done it? <laughs> Embarrassingly, too many times to speak of. Okay. The importance of an unadulterated, holy, perfect Scripture. Ephesians chapter 3 whatever I wrote there. <laughs> I think it's Ephesians 6. If it's not, I'll eat crow for today. Never had crow before, have you? i do not not going to try anytime soon either. Look how important that book is. Ephesians 6, verse number 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is what? There's our offensive weapon. When you look at the armor that's mentioned here in Ephesians 6, how many weapons do we see? One. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Think back, we looked at just a few moments ago in Hebrews chapter number 4. We mentioned how that book was able to take and slice you open and show you for who you are. That's the sword of the Spirit. It's the Word of God, which is able to take you and transform you from a sinner to a saint. And it's able to take you and change you from thinking in one way and recognizing something is different. They did that for me whenever I got saved. It also happened to me because for a short period of time we went to another church. And it was so legalistic, it was fundamental. But they were so legalistic, I remember looking at my wife, who was then my girlfriend, my fiance, and said, there's got to be something other than this. Because this is too much like the church I just came from. And you know where I came from, legalism heaven. Or legalism hell, I guess. <laughs> legalism hell. I said, there's got to be something other than this. And then, by chance, by chance, we came across this guy who was her insurance man, who was in there collecting her insurance money. We were in there talking about where we want to go to church. We want to find something else. And there was this guy named Tom Miles who was teaching at the Altoona Bible Church and said, you know, we have a young adults class. Why don't you guys come? And we went, and my chin hit the floor so many times, and while we were there, it wasn't even funny. Then it came here and had my head, or my head, well, maybe my head too, hit the floor so many times because there were things that a certain redhead guy was teaching that I had was beyond what I even saw at the Altoona Bible Church. It was like, holy smoke. Makes sense. What did Tom Miles do to help show me what was right? What did he use? The scripture. What did a certain red-haired guy sitting in front of me, what did he use to help transform my mind? The scripture. That book means everything. It does. And if you want to find out about the mind of the Lord, where you go about the find out about the mind, just look at the Spirit. The Spirit of God is truth, and thy word is truth. There's more we could go over, but let's move on. We'll do some of this for a little bit. Then I'm going to do something wise. And no later than 20 till, if not a little before, I'm going to shut up. Because usually I have this tendency to ramble on an extra 5 or 10 minutes. 
I'm going to try not to do that. Wherever we leave off here, we'll pick up next time, all right? There is more to come to this, by the way. We're not done with it yet. There is extra stuff coming about this whenever we continue the study, okay? But looking at the soul. Where do you suppose our soul resides? <laughs> Did you hear what she said? Yeah. She mumbled it in case she was wrong, but I heard it. You know what I mean? Don't want to talk too loud because you can't hear. In her body. There we go! <laughs> Our soul resides in most people, like I said, like to start with that first. But that's just a recipient of this stuff over here. Know what I mean? It's not this guy's in charge, this guy's in charge, which helps this guy along because it has the ability to transform this too. I mean this here transforms this, okay? The soul is inside your body. Go to Job chapter 14. Boy, I've been very complimentary to Tracy as in the last few weeks, you know that? I better change that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess not, huh? Oh, seven, uh, Job. <laughs> no sense being crazy unless you show it. Job chapter, okay, we're spinning here again. Just bear with me one second. Job 14. Verse number 22. But his flesh on him shall have what? His flesh upon him shall have pain. Where do we have pain? In our bodies. Does this pain have pain too? Yes. Look at the rest of the verse. And his soul within him shall what? His soul with inside him shall mourn. The point is, in this instance, where is this individual soul? In his body. And has your soul ever mourned? Not going to look at anybody, because I don't want to tug their heartstrings. Have you ever lost somebody that's close to you? I remember the morning I got the phone call from the hospital that I needed to get to the hospital quickly. My mother was sick. I, my feet hit the floor. I put on the oldest jogging pants that looked like heck that I ever had, but they were there. Put them on, put on a shirt, told my wife, I'll let you know how things are going when I get there. Ran into the hospital, walked in right toward her room, and they stopped me. Who are you? Bob Beam. I'm Ruth Beam's son. Mr. Beam, we're sorry, but you ever watch the old program on TV? Was it ER? And when the line that they give whenever somebody passes away, guess what? That part of it is real. Because it was almost word for word what I heard on ER. We're sorry your mother died. There's nothing we could do. How do you think I felt? Soul with inside him shall mourn. I mourn not just for the loss, which it was a little bit, the fact that she was gone. I just saw her the day before. She was great. Everything was going great. I expect her to be home in a week. So I realized that was the last time I would ever see her alive. But you know what hurt worse? 
my mother was not saved. At least that I, I mean, she heard it. Hopefully one time it sunk in. I have a sister who uh, is saved, goes to Christian Missionary Alliance Church up in Evansburg. She's convinced that my mother was saved. Uh, not so much, I don't think. Do you think I mourned because I figured where she was? The soul is inside our body. And what that has the ability of doing is it works on our heartstrings. It's What this is, and I said that kind of unintentionally, but it worked out that way. This is often in Scripture referred to, and we'll go over a lot of this stuff more in the coming time. It's referred to as our heart. And I don't mean that pump that goes in there and goes bumpity bumpity bump, putting, pushing the blood around. When I'm talking about the heart, what am I? If I were to say, Patty Luciano, she sure is a good soul, what does that mean? <laughs> What's that? Well, Bob's looking for somebody to go home with. I didn't even hear what he said, and I don't think I want to hear what he said. <laughs> You're. Your home is about five miles that way. <laughs> if I say Patty Luciano is a good soul, she has a good heart. That's what that's referring to. What the heart is, is the mentality, which you can't see this, I guess, of you. Are there some people that don't have a good heart? I think we call that Washington, D.C., but that's a subject for another day. I say that half-hearted. But um bum It's the mentality of our soul. Go to Proverbs chapter 23. Psalms. Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse number 7. For as he thinketh in his what? Heart. heart. So is he. The way a person thinks in the heart, so is he. Bob already took off headed home. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> as a person thinketh in his heart so is he the way a person thinks that's who they really are can I act sincere nice and not be a good person because you don't know my heart you don't know what's really going inside me. but as a person really does think in his heart so is he Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. In other words, be careful who you make friends with. Watch out. Because the way a person really does think in his heart, that's who they really are. I say Patty is a good soul. She's a good soul. Nadlene, she sure is a good soul. She has a good personality. She has great, she's just a superhuman being. But be careful who you choose as your friends, because eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not. There are those you've got to be careful, because they might look like they're on your side, but they're not so much. I didn't hear that, and I don't think I want to know. <laughs> be careful who your friends are. A soul is the mentality of your heart. It's who you really are. It also ties in, go to Proverbs chapter 15. Look at verse number 28. Ties in really well with that passage that we just looked at. Proverbs 15, 28. The heart of the righteous 
studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pour out what? The, the heart of the righteous, those who are righteous. Now, I'll ask this. I, you already know the answer. Are you righteous? In Christ, In Christ we are. Absolutely. There are some who are self-righteous. There are those who make things, as a church I talked about a little while ago, they were saved, but they were very legalistic. And they would say things. You would sit there and you'd scratch your head, and I really thought there's got to be something else other than this because this is too much like where I used to go. I mean, I knew they were saved. They talked about the importance of having Christ as their Savior. But how they reacted to that truth was inappropriate, was wrong. The mouth of the wicked pour out what kind of things? Careful who you make friends with, right? This also ties in, and we'll leave off here. This also ties in with a little thing called your... your conscience as a person thinks with inside their heart their soul so they are so is he is what the verse actually says you ever hear of somebody has a good conscience is having a conscience okay in accordance with the word if you look at it in an appropriate fashion I should stipulate our conscience is our value system of what's right and wrong. Look at Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. I'm sorry, I said verse number 5. I meant number 15. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts. Now this is, in early Romans, it's talking about the law and how the law just struck a human being down and proved without question, without hesitation, that they were a sinner and that they needed a Savior. That they could never do it on their own. Because could you, could we ever keep the 613 points of the law? If there was one law made, man would screw it up, and they did. And it's a little place called the Garden of Eden. You're allowed to have any of these trees in here you want, with the exception of that one over there. You don't eat of it. And they changed the rules and said, you're not allowed to eat it. Not allowed to even touch it. There was one law. How well did they do in keeping that law? How well would we have done if we were in the same situation? Probably the same thing, right? Verse 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Our, count, our conscience is our value system. In this instance, conscience is not a good thing. Because what, whenever we were failing, whenever I was under the law in the Roman Catholic Church, and I tried to follow that law, guess how well I did with it? Yeah. There's this little thing called the confessional. <laughs> Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. My last confession was 39 years ago. These are my sins. I hope you have a large cup of coffee because we're going to be here a while. But, you know, I would catch myself sinning, and then I would justify my actions. That's what that's talking about. Have a conscience, meanwhile, excusing one another. Oh, no, 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 it's okay. No, no. Can you be a believer and have a good conscience, provided it's 
based on the scripture, you're fine. If I do something and the world looks at me and mocks me, no, it's okay because what the scripture says is fact and I will stand by it. I said I was going to shut up. I better shut up. We're going to go a little farther into this next week. We'll continue on the soul. If I forget and I say, where did I leave off last week? Try to remember because I won't. <laughs> All right. Any questions or comments on what we've looked at as of this point? Let's close in a word of prayer. And we'll continue next week. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity. We, again, have come together to study your word. As we look and see the makeup of man and what he is actually made up of, may we come to the realization even more so on what it is that we truly have in you. And as we recognize what we have in you, may that be our motivation based upon your word to proceed forward and teach the word of God rightly divided and show the world what it's truly missing and how fantastic it really is. We thank you for these things and we pray this all through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for it is through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ most holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you for